Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our course, DC 310 on church and the ministry administration. Uh, for those of you who are here in person and for those of you who are online, good morning. Welcome. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you that we could gather together this morning uh, to take time to learn, study, and be equipped uh, to serve you, to serve your people, and to serve the purposes of your kingdom. God, we ask for the anointing of your spirit. We pray the Holy Spirit will be our teacher, uh, will equip us and uh, impart to us wisdom, understanding, and grace that we may serve you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good morning, everyone, once again. Um, so we started this course last week on church and ministry administration. I'm just going to uh, quickly quickly review uh, some of the things we covered last week and then take things forward. So um, let me just go ahead and share the course notes, which... Uh, is available in the classwork section. And uh, then we will go forward from where we paused. So we gave an overview of what we're going to cover uh, in this course. And um, we, we began with lesson one, where we wanted to uh, emphasize the importance of good administration for church or ministry. And uh, we looked at it from a biblical perspective. We also looked at it from a practical perspective. From a biblical perspective, we said that God is a God of order and design and organization, right? So that means God himself is very organized. He just doesn't, you know, let things happen chaotically. No, he's very, he's a God of plan. He's a God of order. And we see in the, in the, in, throughout the Bible, in the way he related to his people, he actually put order in place. So we look at some biblical examples uh, of this. Then from a practical perspective, also we said that in the world today, people expect us to be organized. Yeah, because that is the way people live it. People are living they when they go somewhere they want everything to be organized they want everything to happen function very pro very well and so they expect the same thing from the church from the christian ministry things should be organized so even people are expecting that and if we don't do things in an organized way they will stay away they don't want to waste their time they don't want to interact with us and so on. so uh, we have to understand from a practical perspective also it's very important. And then we looked at some excuses people make uh, and uh, some. You know, how do we respond to some of those excuses. Right? That was on page five. Then we went into chapter or lesson number two, which is um, what are some of the objectives of good administration? So when we are saying, okay, we want our church or our Christian ministry, we want to have good administration, what are some of the things uh, we want to achieve? So as a background to that, we said that administration is a spiritual ministry. And even administration, it is actually a gifting from God. Some people have been gifted by God to, uh, to be leaders, organizers, administrators, just like we say, okay, some people are gifted by God, are called and gifted by God to be a pastor to be a teacher, to be a apostle or a prophet. The Bible also says that there are people who have been gifted by God, given the grace of God, the anointing of God, to be in the ministry of helps and administrations. That is their calling. They're called by God to do that. So that means we have to give them the opportunity in the church to fulfill that calling. Come, you serve God by being you know, in the ministry of helps and administrations. So administration is an art, it's a science, and it's a spiritual gift. That means God gives a gift. 
but we also can do our part to learn it. So it's the art and the science of it. We can learn by practice. We can get better. And how we organize, how we plan. God gives the grace, but we have to develop the skills. So it's a combination of both. Um, then we also uh, looked at the terms leadership, management, administration. And so really, leadership, management, administration are doing different things, typical in an organization. The leadership has to deal with the vision, direction. Management deals with more of the organization. The administration deals with more of the day-to-day -day execution of things. Uh, but in this course, we will combine all three. So we will touch on all aspects. We combine all three. We will not be focusing only on one. We will combine all three. And then page number seven, we kind of summarized what are the objectives. Are we, in good administration, you have to develop people. You have to establish systems. Uh, we have to fine tune processes. We have to allocate resources. So that is the main thing. You know, people should keep on growing, developing their skills. We have to have good systems in place, how things are happening, and within the systems, how these processes are happening, and how funds are being used, resources and all that are being used. We have to uh, take care of that so that there will be alignment, efficiency, and productivity. We must stay aligned to the vision. We must be efficient, and we must be productive. Then we can achieve our goals and the overall vision of the church and the ministry. Right? So that is the big picture that we are trying to achieve right? in, in, in having good administration. Then we also said for good administration, we need human skill, we need concept organizational skills, we need execution skills. So we have to bring all this together. Right? Page, page seven, bottom of page seven. So we have to bring people skills, organizational skills, execution skills. So we need to know how to work with people, how to nurture them, develop them, guide them, all that. We also need to know how to organize putting things in place, all of that. And then we also need to know how to execute, how to make it happen, how to uh, manage things properly and so on. So these are all of these things. And we're going to talk about many of these things as we go through the course. Lesson number three is where uh, we just kind of introduced it. And then uh, I said I will share uh, an example of uh, our APC trustee so uh, you will get to it so the first thing when you want to start a church or a ministry is to create a legal entity that's the first thing many first thing is one of the first important steps of course we are assuming god has called us to do the ministry <laughs> god has called you to start a church or a ministry that is the most important thing of course so i'm saying first means the practical step right so okay assume we are saying god has called somebody to start a church or start a christian ministry that is there so one of the earliest things we need to do is form a legal entity there, and, and there are many reasons why we said that is important we said uh, we want to be submitted to civic authorities now we want don't want to do anything that is uh, you know not legal you know uh, so, for example, at least in India, you know, uh, sometimes people start a church in the house and uh, they don't register the entity. Then when the police come or some problem, they say, How, what are you doing? You're running a church, you're collecting money, you're doing all this. Uh, are you le legal? You know, no, uh, of course, uh, to meet to pray, we can do that. If it's just a prayer or a Bible, so we can always do that. But if you're running it like an organization, then you have to be like a legal entity. And that's where people get into trouble. That uh, if we are running an organization, but it's not registered, then when there are matters, like especially when it collects money or renting buildings, this, that, uh, we can get into trouble if, we don't, if you're not a registered legal entity. There is, the law can't protect us. 
But if we are, then the moment you're a registered legal entity, you are legally allowed to do many things. The law is on your side. You, know, you can go and rent a building, you can have a bank account, you can have events, conferences, all these things you can. They are legally allowed to do it. So the law is on your side. So we want to be submitted to civic authorities, we want to conduct ourselves blamelessly, we want to be honorable in how we handle finances, and also we need to keep a clear conscience when we are doing all these things. So uh, the importance of uh, forming a le legal entity, we went through this, it gives you credibility before people. So even people, when they want to give money, they prefer, they would definitely ask, you know, is this money going to somebody's personal account or is it going to that organization? So when you have a legal entity, it's going to that organization. It's going to be used for the ministry. Uh, there's a, you can have a separate entity status. That means you can have bank accounts, everything in the name of that organization. It also protects the people. You know, so because you have a separate entity, it's people are don't uh, are not going to be liable for any anything that happens. Uh, you can enlist professional services in in some places. You have tax exempt status, and you can also have access to grants. So um, let's start from here. Right. So this is we are now on page uh, nine. Page nine. When to form a legal entity. What would be a good time to form a legal entity? So as soon as your work gets started, so for example, in APC, we started meeting in February. By April of that year, 2001, we formed the legal entity. So February, March, April, so within about two months. Um, we formed, we went and officially registered. And formed. So we were still very small, only 12, 15 people. But because we have officially started as a church, it is good to have an entity. And of course, we're planning to, you know, build, serve the people here. You know? so, uh, so as soon as you start, you get, get the momentum going, uh, you form the legal entity. Uh, of course, you need to have a core team, and I will mention a little bit on how to select the people. Uh, you need to gather enough money for the initial expense to register the trust. You'll need some money. You have to engage a chartered accountant and all of those things. So uh, you have to pay them. So have enough money uh, and uh, uh, finalize the articles of incorporation. So I'll just go through the uh, articles of incorporation for. All people's church shortly. So today, nowadays, now we have helped a few people uh, in recent times. Uh, other other people who are starting ministries, uh, we have helped them form their organization. It costs about in Indian rupees fifteen thousand rupees. That's it. Uh, so uh, this is basically mainly the lawyer's fees. The lawyer takes the money. He will form the uh, articles sort of thing, and then he will go to the registrar's office with this person. And uh, they will register, they'll sign everything. So the whole thing about 15,000 rupees registered. Yeah. So that's about the money you need to register your organization, get it started. And with that, you can legally go and open an account, bank account. You can publish the name. People can contribute offerings in the name of that ministry. Everything is legal. Yeah. Nobody can say we are doing anything at home. Right? So that's kind of the cost. Now, when we did it, it cost 500 rupees. <laughs> this is in 2001. So it's uh, become about 30 times more today. But those days, it only cost 500 rupees to <laughs> register a trust. Today, it's 15,000 rupees. Yeah, times have changed. It's 20 years ago. Right. Um, now, when you're going to form a legal entity, you need a core team. Minimum, you need three people. You need three people to join to form that entity. And they are referred to as the directors or the trustees or the members, whatever language in different parts of the world. 
uh, we use different language. Now, how do you select these three? Very important. You have to select people who are aligned to the vision and mission. So don't just randomly choose somebody because later on it will cause a lot of problems. It is very important that you select people who are aligned to the vision of the church or the ministry. They are also committed to the vision. Right? Second, you must look for people who are willing to serve. They're not interested in a position. Uh, I want to be treasurer. I want to be secretary. They're not looking for a position. They're just willing to serve. And also, you need people that you should have a good relationship and trust. And because you're going to be working together day in and day out. You're going to be making decisions, small decisions, big decisions. You're going to be making. So you need people with good understanding. So when we started in uh, 2001, so there's Amy, myself, and then there were another couple, Matthew, whom we were friends with. So the Georgie and Joyce. So four of us, we formed the trust. And they were also, they also just started attending all the people. But I knew Georgie from school days. So he was in school. Uh, he was my junior in school. So our friendship went back for many years. From school days, we knew each other. We were serving God. And he used to play and worship them. So they were the initial trustees. So we had a good relationship, good understanding. Then, um, then in uh, in two thousand, uh, I forget which year, but around two thousand twelve or something, they they relocated. They went abroad. Um, they went to UK and then they moved to the US. So because they have relocated, they are no longer directly involved. So we made the change. So I think, uh, uh, again, uh, I forget the exact year, but I think in 2019, um, um, we requested them to resign. It's okay because you're living abroad, you're not, you can't be involved in this thing. So they resigned. And then we added three other people for here locally. So Pastor Jay Kumar. Um, Vinny, Vinny Jacob, uh, so Jacob Matthew, and uh, Melchizedek Jacob, three of them. So they joined, they came as the trust. So now we have five trustees. The two of the original people, because they have gone abroad, they settled abroad, they are not resigned, and we added. So you can do that in the future. Like you know, if you need to change, you can change for practical reasons. So our goal was it's better to have somebody local. Then we can always have meetings, we can discuss, they know what's going on. Uh, whereas if they're, you know, George and Joyce, they're far away in the U.S., then it's practically not. So we made the change. So today we have five trustees. All five are part of the church. They're all, they know what's going on. They're all aligned. So all important decisions, you know, we discuss. We can make very quick decisions. Just email, WhatsApp, discuss, or we meet. Uh, make decisions. Okay. So that is the way it is. Now, just an example. Uh, one of the earlier years, we sent uh, one of our, one of the pastors who were working with us. He worked with us for one of the years. Then he said, "I wanted he wanted to go and start a church in uh, uh, Orissa." So he went. And he's a young that time was young young man. Uh, he finished Bible college here. I mean, in Bangalore, he worked with us for one or two years. Then he decided to go and start his own, the APC church in Orissa. So I remember that time he went there. He'd been there only a couple of months. He's just getting started. And someone came to him. They found out what he was doing. They said, hey, we will form the trust. I, will, I want to be on the trust. It's almost like a stranger. He doesn't know this. So he called me. He said, you know, after this happened, we want to form a trust, but this person has come. He's saying he wants to be on the trust. You know, I said, just say no. Because you don't know this person. And, and somebody being on the trust means you have a 
say in everything. And if you're not in agreement, uh, there can be a lot of problems. Just say, don't be in a hurry. Just say, no, you wait. Uh, you start your work. So he said, no, sorry. He started when he said that person left. That person was not really committed to the vision and mission. Right? He only wanted a position. So he left. So anyway, he started his work and then later on he and he formed the right people, comfortable, he started to form the trust. So you have to be very careful. Uh, because if if people come in there just for position, things like that. And uh, there is uh, problems in the trust, and the whole organization gets affected. So to choose the, the members very, very carefully. Now, the next important thing, uh, uh, once you've selected members, you're ready to form the legal entity. The next important thing is the what is referred to as the Articles of Incorporation, or the trust deed. Right? What is going to be there in the document in the trust deed. Right? So I'm going to share uh, on, online uh, the trust deed for APC. And I, I will put it up in the classwork section and uh, uh, so you can download it from there. But I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I haven't given this print out. Can you see it on, can you see? Uh, Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I did not give uh, give a uh, link, but uh, okay, no problem. I'll put it up in the classroom. Classroom. Right? So, um, uh, so this just uh, this is just a sample. Right? You you can modify it, you can change it, but I want to highlight a few things. So this is for All People's Church. Uh, so we had four people. Uh, you can have min you need minimum of three people, right? So we had four. You can add four or five. Some people have seven people, whatever, whatever number you want. Yeah. But minimum is three. And then uh, you say, who's the main person? Right? So uh, the, the, the uh, settler, that's the main person. Uh, you know, his, the name will be there. And then initially you put some money, you know, 5,000, 500, whatever amount to start, get things started. Um, so you put some amount to get things started, and then the name of the trust. So what is the name of, that's where we say it is all people's church, or what was the name of the ministry, you know, John the Baptist Ministries, <laughs> or whatever. That's, that's your legal name, right? So the bank account will be in that name, and people write a check, it'll be in that name. So whatever that name you feel God has called you, and the name is entirely up to you. Of course, um, it should be a name that is uh, not confused with some some existing ministry. So that way, uh, when you submit this, um, the registrar will do a check. Right? If somebody there's already another organization with the same exact same name, they'll come back and say, "Hey, you have to change the name." So uh, you can't use the exact same name as somebody who's already there in that region. You know, they're in another part of the world, it's okay. But if you're registering in Bangalore, example, you're registering in Bangalore and you go to the registrar here, they will check that it's a unique name. And at least in some way, it has to be different. Then you start, you have to mention what are the aims and objectives of the trust. Now, this is where it is important because in the future, when you're starting any ministry, this will be legally held. You'll be held, legally held to follow this aims and objectives. Right? So, uh, example, if your aim and objective is to have churches, Bible colleges, you can't go and start uh, you know, some call center or some, some business. Yeah. In the name of this, no, you have said this. This trust is for the purpose for religious work. So you can't go and start a business that is not aligned to the objectives of the trust. That is not allowed. Right? So you have to carefully state what you want to do. So we said uh, we are here to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it is very clear. 
you know, we are here for the gospel of Jesus. So, I mean, this is a Christian trust. It is not general NGO type. So we are a religious trust. We are here to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Very clear. Right? And we can then the other thing we did was make it as broad as because we cannot foresee everything we may do. So make it broad. Any kind of ministry, we should be a Christian minister. I'm not saying general. Any kind of Christian work, we should be able to do through this trust. Right now, maybe we are only 12 people. We are meeting for worship and prayer. But you know, in the future, suppose we want to start a Bible college. Suppose we want to print books or we want to have TV minutes. This, 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 this. It should, it should allow us. You know. So uh, the goal is keep the articles broad enough to accommodate whatever kind of Christian work you may do in the future. Unless you know this is the only thing I will do. Example. I will run a Christian home for children. Okay. If you're sure that this trust is that's the only thing you're going to do, okay, fine. So it will be very simple. Articles of encouragement. We are running a Christian home for underprivileged children. And then you mentioned, you know, okay, between this age to this age, we will provide them food, shelter, education, those things. Very focused. Okay, but that kind of an article of incorporation or trustee in the future, if you want to start a Christian school for these same children, it may be difficult because it is not stated. You said only we will only run a Christian home for children. We give them food and this, but it's not stating that if you want to start a school or a vocational school, vocational training. If it's not mentioned uh, under that same trust, it could be difficult. I'm not saying, you know, you can, you can always amend it. That means the trustees can come and say, okay, we are making a change. That means that we are saying we will add this aspect to the trust. So you have to go through the process. You have to, the trustees have to come, they make an amendment, you go back to the registrar's office and say, hey, when we formed the trust, we said we'll only run a children's home. Now we feel we want to start a school, we want to do set up a vocational training, et cetera, et cetera. So we're amending the trust. You have to give it, you have to amend the trust. Then you can start, right? So it is better in the beginning itself, you know, to state whatever you want. So we've stated all kinds of things, you know. Uh, to provide, say, relief work, charitable work for all kinds of people, to printing work, books, uh, whatever we, which is what we, we are doing during Christian literature, uh, uh, videos, so digital work. In those days, we only had, we were thinking, you know, we could think of text, audio, and video films. Uh, we, we didn't think of the internet as a big thing, but it kind of comes under that digital work uh, we can you know uh, organize churches uh, we can establish local churches which is again what we're doing we can set up institutes and seminaries which is bible college which is what we are doing uh, we can uh, establish ten uh, bible teachers seminaries colleges uh, um, schools and churches you know to prepare um, we can run um, we can bring people, we can hold conferences, we can conduct seminars, workshops, conferences. We can even undertake in Christian related research, you know, Christian research work. We can uh, explore, experiment with different field work. Uh, we can set up uh, different groups across the country. We can work all across the country. Uh, we can also work with other Christian organizations, you know, so we can build partnerships with other organizations. Uh, we can buy land. Uh, we can work with, uh, uh, take the services of other 
organizations, we can buy land or lease property, uh, we can hire and build buildings, do those kinds of things. Uh, we make use of the money in a way uh, uh, that, uh, that, of course, we, we will not put them, their money of the people at risk, but make wise investments with that, and so on. So we can, again, uh, pay people for the work they do for us. Uh, we can give donations to other organizations. We can open branches anywhere in India. Uh, we can provide residential accommodation, you know, for people who come for training, so on. Uh, we can do all deeds and activities that are in line with the objectives of the trust. Uh, we cannot use the money for profit. What money comes into the trust, we cannot you know, use it for business things, basically. Right? And uh, uh, we are going to we'll keep accurate accounts. And we will follow the Income Tax Act in our country. And this is the powers of the trust, of what they will do, the trustees, what will they do on behalf of the trust. So these are the roles and responsibilities of the office bearers. Right? So they, they are allowed to do all these activities on behalf of the trust. This is what they can do. So uh, that is their responsibilities and so on. Okay. So, all this is here, you know, and these are these are typical, right? That means this is what you will typically have in an article of incorporation. But it is, covers everything. What the trust will do, what will the directors, what are they allowed to do for on behalf of the trust? Uh, is there anything that they should not be able to do? You mention it. And uh, we also have the opportunity to change uh, trustees and so on, right? So this is just a sample. Uh, I will put it up on the classwork se section, and uh, you can, you know, uh, look at this and then adapt this for whatever you are doing. I'm not saying you should copy this exactly. This is for the church. Now, if you're starting a church, obviously you can use the same thing. Uh, but if you're starting a different kind of Christian ministry, you just modify this to match uh, the objectives. Of what you want to do and how you want to run the organization okay so let me just see if there are any questions from people on the chat any uh, everyone's following any questions here so far yeah um go ahead um, so for the trustees was there any qualifications like they should be in a new order. Is there something that they're all trusted to be like Yeah. So the question here, uh, Jeffina asked the question is uh, are there any qualifications for the trustees? The only thing is they should be an adult. That means like about 18 or better about 21. That's it. Nothing else. So uh, about 18 and uh, yeah, and the other qualifications are more like. Like what we said personal like they should have the same vision they should be aligned to the thing so but legally only requirement is they are above if they're an adult to be part of the trust and uh, they yeah in terms of citizenship so for in india example we're forming the legal entity uh i i i, I don't think there's a restriction that you know, you should be a citizen of India. Right? You, uh, so you have to be an adult. Now, in the US, example, if we are forming a non-profit organization in the US, uh, in certain states, there is a rule that they cannot be family members. So they have to be non-related people. Any adults, but they shouldn't be like, you know, family members. Certain states have certain rules like that. So I think in different parts of the world, they may have some requirement. Generally, it is you're an adult and you know, you're able to fulfill the duties of the trust. No, no other. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
for a very huge amount of questions. The question is going like very less Yeah, this is good. This is for the basics that we are not making general. Yeah, so the trust, trust deed or the articles of income. So the question is, uh, we have mentioned Christian school. Can we start a regular Christian school? So that is one of the plans we have to start a regular Christian school. I mean, that will teach, you know, like the Cambridge syllabus or something. Uh, so that's one of the plans. But we, so as the, because the trust allows us to do, we can start, but we will need to get all the other licenses. So we are permitted to start. But we have to get all the other government licenses or accreditation, example, uh, depending on what syllabus you want to do, if it's uh, the Indian syllabus, ICSC or the IG, or any of the foreign syllabus. Uh, you'll have to get that accreditation. Those things we have to. But some needs to have to Yeah. They may Yes, so that comes with, so the, the trust allows us to start a school, but in order to start the school, there will be all other requirements given by other agencies. So we have to meet those requirements. So that will be a separate process. Yeah. Uh, you know, they will need teachers who are all qualified. Uh, you need whatever, so many things. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, for those licenses. Uh, Correct. Based on the trust, we will not. So the trust allows us to start, but in order to start that, you'll have to have all those other licenses. So, for example, APC Bible College. The trust allows us to start APC Bible College. So we've started APC Bible College. But APC Bible College at right now is not accredited like with any organization. The challenge, there are several challenges. One is when we started APC Bible College, we wanted to run our own curriculum. That means we designed the courses. The course content is what we have developed. The moment we go to some accreditation, say in India, we go to ATA and we say we want to get accredited. Part of the requirement is we have to run some of their courses, which we don't want to do because we don't see value completely in that. We want to run our courses because this is what we feel our, uh, people need. So that is a struggle, like, you know, to get that accreditation, you have to run those courses, but we don't want to run those courses. We don't necessarily see value in it. Like, for example, if we had to teach Hebrew and Greek, and all of a sudden, like, where are you going to get people to teach Hebrew and Greek? And what is the real value in those things? So, the, so, the same. so we have decided that, okay, we will remain non accredited for because of these reasons. But we want the quality of our education itself to be the basis on which people will come and study with us. Otherwise, we can we can teach those courses just to get the label. But then our heart is not in it. We don't see value in that. We, we see value in the other courses, which we have designed uh, three years of thing. So that's why we're still not accredited. But students will study with us because of what we, the content we have, and how we train them, and what we give into them. So that's because anytime we want accreditation, they have their requirements. You have to teach these courses. You have to do like this, and uh, if you don't comply, we you won't get accepted. Yeah. Okay. So any questions from our online students? Any other questions? OK. So the articles of incorporation, I'll put it up in the class, are, are the, what we use for APC. You can uh, 
modify it and uh, feel free to uh, adapt if you want. And also locally in your part of the world, uh, you know, things may be a little different in terms of uh, these articles of incorporation, uh, but uh, you can use ours. Now, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, so because we are registered in Bangalore, India, we can operate anywhere in India. We are legally allowed to do that, anywhere within the country. Now, when we started, when we sent pastors out, like our students who graduated, and uh, when they want to work with us and they want to go and start a church somewhere, we say initially you can start just as under us, like as APC, you're a branch. But we always tell them, as soon as possible, you register your own ministry in that place. So that you can have full ownership of that ministry. Uh, some of them have done it, some of them have not done it. You know, just whatever they're comfortable with, we don't force. So, you know, now out of, uh, I think about 11 church plants outside, all of them are, have studied with us, they have gone, they've started. Uh, I think only two of them, I think only two of them have actually formed their own trust, APC Barampur and APC Kalyan. So, but, uh, so uh, APC Barampur, they used the name APC Barampur. In Kalyan, he uses a different name, whatever name he likes, which is fine. But they, they are part of APC. So, it is the APC Kalyan, APC Barampur. But the trustee, uh, they have registered as, like one has registered, the, you know, it's called Living Word Trust or something. But they're functioning as APC Kalyan. And uh, one is, uh, I think it's registered as APC Barampur or something. Uh, the, all the others are just operating as an extension of APC Bangalore. Um, but they use the local name, like APC, Baloda Bazaar, APC, Kohima, which is okay. So we give them a letter, say, okay, they are a branch of APC Bangalore, and this is the name that they are operating in, uh, or APC Bangalore. But they are, they are operating as part of this main entity. They have not registered as a separate entity. We, we encourage them, as whenever you're ready, you form it. But the thing is, the moment you form an entity, you also have responsibility, legal responsibility. You have to file uh, your income, all those papers you have to file with them. So if they're not in a position to do that, then they just operate under APC Bangalore because we take care of all that work here. Uh, so it's comfortable for them. They can just concentrate on the ministry to the ministry. Um, but so we, we, we've kept those options open. If you want to have your own legal entity, it's fine. If you want to operate under APC Bangalore, that's fine. So the moment you form a legal entity, you would also have to follow all the regulatory findings for the government. That means every year, every year, uh, actually you do this, uh, every year, but also you do it throughout the year, you have to file your income. What is the money coming into your organization? You file that with the government. And if you are having staff, then you have to, and you're paying them salaries, you have to deduct the tax, the professional tax, and you have to give that to the government. And you have to file it for the town. So it's it, the moment you form a legal entity, there is some work to do. Right? Uh, uh, as far as the government is concerned, uh, that uh, so now uh, an accountant will help you do all that work. So we don't have to personally do it. An accountant, chartered accountant, will come 
they will help you do all this. They will file on behalf of the organization. They will file all the paperwork with the governor. So they take care of all the work. But it has to be done every year. And every month, we deduct the professional tax. And that tax has to be given back to the government. So that happens. You know, I think once we keep paying that money back. So these are things that come into place when you form a legal entity. But that is what gives us the right to operate legally in the country uh, when we follow the, the rules and regulations. Right? Okay. So let's pause here. And uh, we will uh, continue this after the break. Uh, those of you online, feel free to ask questions. Uh, these are just some practical things. I hope it's being useful and uh, you know uh, gives you an understanding of how the church runs and so. So we'll meet in ten minutes after the break. Thank you. Ooh.